Well, welcome everybody. We've been chatting a little bit before the meeting, so um, I'm, I appreciate you all taking the time during the holiday season, the beginning of the holiday season to be here. So we have Lincoln Mitchell. He's written this just delightful book. Um, and I don't know, some of you might have read it already. I know I've talked to a couple of people who have. Some people are going to check out the meeting before they read it. The 100 most important players in baseball history. I'll pretty much let Lincoln uh, explain things a little bit before um, we take questions. But just to introduce Lincoln, uh, really an interesting career. Uh, he's um, a political analyst, a pundit, um, and a writer based in New York City and San Francisco. Uh, he writes a wonderful blog called Kibitzing with Lincoln, which I highly recommend. Um, just a great perspective on a lot of different things, San Francisco, baseball, um, the Hamas, Israel war. I mean, you've been spot on in your Thank you. um, thoughts and analysis of that um, in particular, but tonight we're just going to talk about baseball. So um, let's see, he teaches at Columbia's uh, School of International and Public Affairs. In addition to his books on topics ranging from foreign policy to the history of San Francisco to baseball, Lincoln's writing has appeared at CNN, NBC, the New York Times, the San Francisco Examiner, and numerous other publications. Okay. So we'll start out uh, listening to you, Lincoln. Well, what do you have thank, what do you got for us? Thank you for, for having me. Thank you, Mary. And thank you uh, for, for inviting me tonight, Dennis. Um, and also, it's always good to speak to people in Wisconsin, because even though I've, I'm not from there, I do have a connection there. My son is finishing his undergraduate degree at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So uh, my alma I mean, mater. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you have any Madison. I assume most, some of you must have gone there. Any Madison people there? But uh, so I do get to Madison. I get to Wisconsin a few times a year. We'll be out there in May uh, for his graduation, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so this book is called "The One Hundred Most Important Players in Baseball History," and I just want to um, first, you know, if this were in person, we would hang out a little bit afterwards. You'd all come over. I'd sign your copy. You'd buy the book for me. But we can't do that here, but you can buy it pretty at all of your online booksellers. So just please, I would urge you to, to buy it. It's a great holiday gift uh, for any uh, any baseball fans in your in your life. Um, so I I have been a baseball fan like most of you, I assume, for, for pretty much my entire life. And I, I think the first World Series that I paid a lot of attention to was 1975. And and that if those of you who who remember that World Series, some of you obviously don't or can't. But, uh, you know, that was, if you were a seven-year-old kid, even with no strong rooting interest, it was enough to make a fan for life out of you. And that's certainly what it helped do for me. But, you know, I'm not a sports writer. I don't go to the dugout and, and stick a mic in, a, in you know, a Aaron Judge's face and ask him for a quote. That's not my skill set. I've done that once or twice, and it was fun, but it's not really what I do. But I am a political scientist and a political historian. And what fascinates me is the role of baseball in the larger culture and in the larger history, but also the development of Major League Baseball and baseball as an institution, as an kind of important American institution. And one way to think about that is when you say to somebody, I love baseball, which all of us would say, we wouldn't be on this call if we didn't feel that way. It can mean so many things, right? It can mean I'm a, you know, I'm a fan of the San Francisco Giants or the Milwaukee Brewers or the New York Yankees or something. It can mean I love playing baseball. It can mean I remember playing baseball when I was a kid. So, so there's this very broad concept of, of what baseball is. And I kind of uh, align myself with that view with Steve Goldman, who is a friend and a colleague, who may, some of you may know his work, who frequently says baseball is everything and everything is baseball. And, and I, and I uh, believe that. And this book is my way of exploring that. And what I wanted to do, I mean, I, the kind of who are the 100 greatest players in baseball history is a, is a common genre, right? Every few years, Bill James, Joe Posnaski, Maury Allen, whoever it is, they write that book. And then you argue, you know, should Harmon Killebrew be 103 or should he be 98? You know, uh, should Willie Mays be two or should Henry Aaron be one? You know, and those are fun arguments. But, you know, those tell one side of the baseball story. I'm interested in a different side. Who are the 100 people? who had the greatest impact, the most important players. And when you think about that question, there's a couple of ways to go from there. there. There are, you know, the academic in me says, okay, let's take a step back and define our terms. What does it mean to be important? And what does it mean to be a baseball player? Because all of us, 
you know, anyone who's like played catch, been on a little league team, played in college, these are all, but, you know, or just, you know, played wiffle ball in the backyard. To some extent, we can, we can make a claim to be baseball players. But I wanted to be a little, a little less open than that. So in the so I did two things. One, I, I'm really I'm fascinated by baseball's prehistory, but I don't think enough readers are. So I put a, a time constraint on this. These are so this be a baseball player who played the game in 1900 or later. So that's 123 years. And then I said had to play at the highest level available to them. So if we think about that, that means a lot of different things. For example. If you were white and American until 19, from 1900 on, that meant the major leagues. If you were non-white, that usually meant after 1947 in the major leagues and before 1947 in various other leagues, in the Caribbean, the Negro Leagues here in the United States, the NPB, various other places. The one exception is Sadahara O, who technically could have played in the major leagues, and it was good enough, and he, you know, but he didn't. But he's such an important figure, I, I included him. And then there's another category, which are people who are still not allowed to play really in the major leagues, and those are women. So I wanted to find a way to include women who are an important part of the story. So the women in the book, some, uh, Jackie Mitchell, who is, I should just say is not in this book because she's related, we're not related, um, is in the book. She was a barnstormer, but she that was the highest level available to her. Um, Alyssa Nacken, uh, Ila Borders, these women played at, at the levels available to them. So... So that was kind of the criteria for what is a player, but that's the easy criteria. The harder criteria is <clears throat> what is important? How does a player get to be important? And I broke it down into a handful of, of categories and then a handful of some subcategories. So the category, one category is people who are important for things that essentially have nothing to do with baseball, but that happen to have been baseball players. So one of them is Jim Bunning. Jim Bunning was a very fine pitcher, primarily for the Phillies and the Tigers. First pitcher, I think, to win, a, other than Cy Young, to win 100 games in each league, to throw a no-hitter in each league. But Jim Bunning is, is more important for being a member of the U.S. Senate and a member of the House of Representatives. And he served 12, you know, I think he served a total of over 20 years in Congress. So like his politics or not, and I put myself in the latter category, a very important person in American history who happened to be a baseball player. And the other is Mo Berg who was not a good, as good a baseball player as Jim Bunning, but was hugely important in World War II. So Mo Berg is in the book because of that. Then there are players whose impact was really just because of their impact on the field. And this includes people like um, Ernie Banks, whose enormous impact in, in, in as, and there are a lot of people, a few people in the book in one city, the fan base in one city, Ernie Banks, Stan Musial, George Brett are players like that. And then the more the players who had, a, had an important role in something to do with the game, something very specific, Kurt Flood, Tommy John, um, players who symbolize something important, Eddie Goodell. And then there are a handful of, a small handful of players who were just in, extremely important American cultural figures. And that would include people like Babe Ruth, People like Jackie Robinson, Yogi Berra, Willie Mays. So that's kind of the, the, the outline of the book. And, and you know, so, so what we usually do in these conversations is people want to know is so-and-so in the book, and I usually say yes or no and can, and, and, and can, answer, um, and can answer why, you know, why, why they're in the book or why not. And the other way to think of this book is a history of baseball in 100 players. Who are the 100 players – that they can best tell the history of baseball over the last 125 years. That's another way to maybe think of this. Anyway, I don't. I, I want to get to the Q and A because I know people always like to chat. So happy to take any questions, comments, you know, thoughts. Who's in the book? Type questions, whatever you you like. And I'm going to look and just see if the uh, um, yeah, the idea of important. I, yeah, that's something I was going to touch on. You know how you define important. So. Thanks for addressing that. I, it seemed like, um, you know, you had plenty of historical players, obviously, who were important, but um, a lot of these people are important in, to modern culture in baseball now, you know, like Glenn, Glenn Burke and Dusty Baker in the high five and, um, you know, Buck O'Neill and his influence. And, and so, 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go no, go ahead. No, I'm done. No, no, but I'm sorry. no, I was just saying, I'm also fascinated. They're, they're Dusty Baker to me, and there's a handful of players like this, um, Casey Stengel, who is interesting, actually parallel to Dusty Baker, both very good outfielders as players and then kind of legendary as Casey Stengel is more successful, but he was more successful than everybody as a manager. Um, but I, I'm fascinated by these players who are connectors, right? I'm fascinated by a player, uh, um, excuse me, a man, a, a man who plays alongside Henry Aaron as a rookie and, you know, manages Jose Altuve, right? Uh, one of my, Casey Stengel, my favorite data point about Casey Stengel is, does anyone know who batted third in the first for the opposing team for the first game in which Casey Stengel played? Zach Wheat? Uh, no. Good guess, but no. <laughs> Against the other team, his opponents. Babe Ruth. Babe. No, it's National League. No. Honus Wagner. Oh yeah. That that's that's you know Honus Wagner is uh, that that's the prehistory right? Who played into the 20th century? Then. In the last game he played, and Honus Wagner's in the book, and the last game Casey Stengel managed, do you know who batted cleanup for the other team? Uh, uh, I'm a Mets fan, so I should know this. Uh, McCovey? Good guess. Dick Allen. Ah, Phillies. Okay. So, yeah. so the connection from Honus Wagner to Dick Allen, right, in one extraordinary baseball career. So, so... I, I, that that's a way to tell a story about baseball. And then there are also people in here who play, who had negative, really negative impacts, right? People who I think, um, you know, Frankie Frisch. I and mean, Frankie Frisch's role in the historiography of baseball has been very damaging. Eddie Collins. Eddie Collins, who was um, a great player, an answer to a great trivia question, who has the most hits of any graduate of an Ivy League university? Most people will say Lou Gehrig. Uh but the answer is Eddie Collins. Both of them went to Columbia. Uh, but Eddie Collins was pressured by a guy named, I believe it was Izzy Mush, Isidore Mushnick, who was a left-wing member of the Boston City Council to who wanted to, because the, 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 the left uh, in the 1930s and 40s across racial lines, white and African-American, were, were very pushing to get rid of the color line in baseball and to bring black players in. And he demanded that the Red Sox give a tryout to three black players, one of whom was Jackie Robinson. And Eddie Collins, you would think that Eddie Collins, still probably the greatest second baseman in American history, would look at Jackie Robinson, a middle infielder, and say, yeah, we could use that guy. He decided Jackie Robinson wasn't good enough. And, and to me, okay, forgetting just that's just obviously racism, right? But, but we have to tell that story. Because you can't tell the story of Jackie Robinson, who of course is obviously in the book, right? Who has such a an important and positive impact, not just on baseball, but on America. On America. But Jackie Robinson, we only had to get, we only had to get to Jackie Robinson because of the racism that kept him out. So so I wanted to tell some of the, the, the less pleasant stories about baseball history because those people are important too. You know, Kurt Schilling is not my favorite person. Um, not least because I, you know, Yankees fans in, as a New Yorker, so I never liked, you know, what he's doing with the Red Sox. But the story of Kurt Schilling and, and, and what that tells us about the interaction between politics and sports today is is fascinating. So, yeah, those are types of things that um, in your book that are just little fascinating nuggets, like Eddie Collins' connection with that sham tryout with the Red Sox and. Yeah, there were a lot of little things I didn't know. So, um, and, and you, yeah, you mentioned the bad influences, you know, Conseco, um, Hell Chase, Ty Cobb, yes. um, yeah, P. Rose even. Yeah, yeah. And, and and some of these are much more much more ambiguous. I, I, you know, I'm fascinated by Jose Canseco. And I went with Canseco rather than McGuire because I just think McGuire is boring. And... <laughs> I mean, you really do. And, and one reason I'm fascinated by Canseco is I grew up in the Bay Area, in San Francisco specifically. And I remember that 1989 World Series. I don't, I, I remember for two reasons. One, because just before game three started, we had a pretty big earthquake and that always sticks in my head. I don't, I choose not to remember the, the final ending of that World Series. But I, I, so, so I remember just how good the young Jose Canseco was. But he's an extraordinary ball player. I did talk to a guy who was an executive with the Giants at the time, and he said, you know, the A's were a steroid club even then. Um, but 
But Canseco, you know, he's a goofball, right? I mean, he's some wacky stuff. Extremely talented player, and he's the truth teller. Right? He's not playing the games that Rafael Palmeiro and that Mark McGuire are playing. He's telling it like it is. And I think that's really valuable. So I'm not sure where he, like, I don't want to pass any moral judgment. I mean, on, on Jose Canseco, because he didn't choose to lie and make things up. He, and, he, and he called people out. And, th- and that's why he became so unpopular. So I'm fascinated by that. Hal Chase, clearly a negative impact, but an important part of the story, right? You, you know, Joe Jackson, the, the 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 scandal that was 1919 World Series didn't come out of nowhere. It helped us explain what the game was like. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, questions. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, so uh, I think we all bring uh, our background and, you know, sort of biases to, you know, to everything in life, really. I mean, if I were to write a book or I could come up with a list like this, I probably, I mean, I'm from, Carib- from the Caribbean, I'm from Puerto Rico. So I probably would have like about 30 <laughs> players from from my neck of the woods. Uh, you know, I'd have Martin Diego and Pedro, Orlando Cepeda's dad, Pedro Cepeda was a great player. Uh, so my question is, how do you, when researching and writing this book and coming up with a list, how, if at all, did you kind of, you know, check whatever biases uh, you might have? Not biases, that's a kind of loaded word, but, you know, your background of who, at the end of the day, right. you are as a person, your identity, and how that skews uh, or informs how you see baseball. And we all do bring our biases to projects like right. this. Right. And I will say that I will answer your question honestly. And, and that is to say that I did not have some magic formula where points were awarded. I made lists. I talked about it with people, you know, old baseball fans who I knew. There are two, I think, very clear biases, although I think all three of these players deserve a, deserve mention on their on their own. Um, I think I, I, I'm I you might think about players from the Caribbean. And I did try to bring I didn't bring in Cepeda's father, but I did try to bring in. You know, um, Latino players from before 1947, Cristobal Torriente, people, you know, right. um, and also Dolph Luque, who was a f- extraordinarily interesting part of that, you know, story. Um, yes. But there are three Jewish ball players in this book. I think you I think everybody would have to include them. But to me, it was less. I didn't really have to agonize over it as much. And Hank Greenberg is is forgotten among those three. But Hank Greenberg playing in Detroit in the 1930s, right? Well, I mean, you know, while Father Coughlin is ranting on the radio, I thought was too important to leave out. The one, I did, a, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Justin McGuire's Baseball by the Book podcast. Yes. yes, I listened to it. So he asked me why Willie McCovey was in the book. And I told him the truth, which is, you know, I've got to spend the rest of my life eating burritos in the mission and hanging out in the Richmond district, eating Chinese food with my friends. And I can't do that if I leave Willie McCovey out of this book. So... So to the extent there's a bias here, there's a bias about the Giants and the two players that people focus on, because because in the first third of the 20th century, the Giants were the most important team. So Merkel, Chase, who was with the Giants for a while, Casey Stengel, John McGraw, Christy Matthews, and it's hard to leave these guys out, even Frisch. You know, Mel Lotka's a great player, but not in the book, you know. Um, Willie Mays, I don't think there's much of a discussion there. Uh, Juan Marichal, to me, there's no discussion there. Felipe Alou, to me, absolutely no discussion there. I think Felipe Alou, you know, I, I was going back and forth with Peter Dreyer, who is, of course, a big advocate for Kurt Flood to be in the Hall of Fame, which I agree with. You know, I mean, I, I would support that if I had a vote. But if I could put one person in, it'd be Felipe Alou. If one person who's out and in. I, so I'm a big, I'm really, to me, that's a very important person. But uh, Buster Posey and Willie McCovey. And I put Posey in for a couple of reasons. One is the Buster, in addition to the one I told you. One is the Buster Posey rule. It's, you know, this is a guy who, who and then the, sitting out the COVID season, it's a way to, be, to at least bring that COVID experience, which is so important, into, into the book. And then retiring at his prime of his career and leaving money on the table. I thought that was fascinating. McCovey, well, I mean, I, he's my all-time favorite player, so I put him in the book. It's my book, and I put him in. Um, but, <laughs> but also, McCovey is this... Um, just fascinating moment of, first of all, I think he's the most underrated player, one of the most underrated, truly great players, right? I mean, he wasn't even the best player named Willie from Alabama on his team for most of his career, right? And think about that. But but there's, you know, there's baseball is has this fascinating combination of luck and skill. And in the bottom of the ninth inning of game seven of 1962, he does exactly what he's supposed to do. He hits the ball as hard as anyone's going to hit a ball in a baseball field. 
and a few feet either way, and he's a hero and he's remembered forever. But that's one thing. But then Charles M. Schultz immortalizes him in two different comic strips that, that winter, the following winter. So that was why he was in there. And the other reason is, you know, there's, when Willie Mays, up until 2000, the year 2000, Willie McCovey was more popular in San Francisco than Willie Mays. And George Moscone, who, does anyone know who George Moscone is? I'm always curious about this. George Moscone, I, there's a, there will be a very good biography of George Moscone out into 2025. Um, so I urge you to get that. Um, but if you're interested in San Francisco political history, but George Moscone was mayor in 1977. And uh, he, there was, he, he was 77 or 78 when he proclaimed Willie McCovey Day. And he said, Willie McCovey is a San Francisco institution like the cable cars or the Golden Gate Bridge. And he was kind of right. So that's why. So those those are my biases that I that I find. That's a good question, Carlos. Yeah. So there was one or two in the chat that I wanted to address. Absolutely. Um, so how did you narrow down your final list? This is from Gary. Um, uh, like I said, I didn't. I, I'm not going to pretend that I had a real formula here. You know, I, I don't want to be dishonest with you. I I really. Um, I made a list. I thought about it a lot. I discussed with a lot of people. People went on the list and off the list, you know, so I didn't just like come up with the first hundred. I I, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and saying, how can I leave Albert Pujols out of the book? And kind of agonizing that and trying to fit him back in and and then thinking um, th there was a few other players who, you know, some uh, uh, Bill White, right? Um, yeah. that, that, that It's got to be room for him, but there's, you know, you have to take people out to put people in. And, and that's... Um, that's more difficult than it sounds. So I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the others. Today, I'm, I would think about, um, someone asked about Bruce Bochy in a previous talk. No, Bruce Bochy would not be in the book, but like Frank Chance, you know, uh, from Tinker Sever, important person to kind of making baseball more popular, popular culture. Um, so so there were, there were, I'm trying to think of other guys who I left out, who I, who I agonized over, but Pujols comes, Pujols was the biggest. Um, Bill White was one. There were, there were a few that, you know, I really thought about. And, and then I, there were some areas, I guess bias, another bias would be, I'm really interested in the second generation of African-American players. So not the kind of beginning with, say, Jackie Robinson through Frank Robinson, right, that era. So this includes Dick Allen, it includes Vita Blue, it includes um, Reggie Jackson. And, 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 but they were, and they were all in the book because I think it's such an important part of the kind of racial politics I uh, of I, I I ended up putting Cristobal Torriente in, but I agonized about you know Martin DeHigo and and Louis Tion Senior. So there was a tough; those were tough; those were tough calls. Um, someone else uh, says Dave says is Frank Robinson. Frank Robinson is absolutely in the book, um, and and Robinson is in the book for for a few reasons. One, I just think he's one of the great. Is Frank on the? I don't see Frank here. Um, no, that no, that Frank was the player. Who asked that? Dave, sorry. Um, I thought Frank, I thought Frank Robinson asked that from the grave. No, Frank Robinson is in the book uh, for a few reasons. One, the, the first African American manager in, but not just in the American League, in the National League as well. Um, also winning the MVP award, and the first player to win the MVP award in both leagues. So, so Robinson is in the book, and I think Robinson um, is a long. Robinson, Musial, and McCovey are the three most underrated, truly great players. And no player in baseball history is a victim of the tyranny of round numbers to the extent of Frank Robinson. But there's a great story there, too, and not great, but interesting story. Robinson had 586 career home runs. At the time he retired, that was fourth ever, right? When you're when you're when you're trailing Henry Aaron, Babe Ruth, and Willie Mays, and then your name, you're that's pretty good company. He had, I believe, 2,917 hits when he retired. Again, 83 hits short. If he gets up to 3,600. At that time, it's him, Mays, and Aaron, because Ruth never had 3,000 hits. And everyone remembers Frank Robinson. But he didn't. Well, why not? And one reason is that the last two years that he was playing, his manager chose not to play him as much. But his manager was himself. And that tells you something about Frank Robinson. That he was not, I mean, think of compared to Pete Rose, former teammate, by the way. 
who's chasing that Ty Cobb record and really humiliating himself, in my view, before we even know about the gambling issues. But Robinson is sitting himself down because he's trying to build a pretty bad Cleveland team into a winner, right? Um, and to me, that was uh, fascinating. So, so, so that was very important. So Robinson is absolutely in the book. I don't know why my hand went up. Um, Your hand went up because you made a gesture. Oh. <laughs> if you do a thumbs up, if you leave it there a while, it'll automatically, you don't. Fascinating. Yeah. Anyway, so that's that's my answer to Frank Robinson. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead. I just have a, uh, not to uh, monopolize the questions, but I, when reading the book, I read it on a tablet. My only note that I made is uh, WTF the ego. Uh, <laughs> so my uh, my uh, questions were uh, you just just basically. I, I think all were phenomenal choices, but I was very interested about why uh, 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 Torriente over the ego or Mendes, and also why Eddie, Eddie Gadell over Jim Abbott, for example, if you are, if his value is as a person with a disability. So well, because for the two, I was like, huh, I wonder what well, he was thinking. So Torriente those. Diego was, was, could have gone either way, you know, and, and, I, and I would have liked to include both of them. It was just a tough call. Um, <laughs> Jim <laughs> Abbott, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, my wife is from Flint, Michigan. And we, early on, before we married, we were back in Flint. She and we were, I'd never been to Flint before. I actually, I've been to, not been to Flint before. And she was taking me to some, um, like, hot dog stand she used to go to in high school, right? Some, like, hole-in-the-wall place, Angela's, if any of you have been to Flint. And, and we, I walk in, and it's covered with newspaper clippings about Jim Abbott. And I say... Why are there so many clippings about Jim Abbott? And Marta says, oh, I knew Jimmy Abbott when he was a kid because he was from uh, Flint, Michigan. And they must have, you know, they grew up and, and he, he was her sister, younger sister's age. I did not put Goodell in the book because he had a, because he was a little person. Oh, okay. in that, I put him in the book because of the role he played, because he illustrates something about baseball. Jim Abbott is, you know, I mean, a, a, a very good pitcher, but you know, I mean, like top left-handed pitcher for a while. But you know, it's it's a fascinating story and kind of ex, uh, you know, just kind of a um, inspiring story in many respects. But Goodell gets to that story of the crisis of baseball in the early 1950s, which is so overlooked. I wrote a book; I don't have it in front of me uh, about a kind of a revisionist history of the Giants and Dodgers moving west. Because my argument is that baseball was failing if those two don't don't move west, and that includes moving, you know, from Boston to Milwaukee and all that kind of thing. Um, so, so Goodell, play, you know, pinch pinch hitting for this Browns team that that's drawing like a high school football team or something. So that's why I put him in instead of Jim Abbott. Plus, his connection to Bill Beck. Now, Bill right. Beck is, wasn't a player. Right. But if you talk about influence on baseball mm -hmm. and, you know, he was so maligned, but then now all these teams, not only minor league teams, but major league teams doing all these shenanigans um, right. that we would very much miss. Yeah, that we, we would be very bored without. And there are three Bill players Vest. in this book with very direct connections to Bill Beck, right? Mm -hmm. Eddie Goodell, Larry Doby and Satchel Paige and Larry Doby and Satchel Paige. I mean, Bill Beck um, brings African-American players into the American League. Not that long after the Dodgers, Jackie Robinson plays for the Dodgers. And Vec, as some of you, I assume, know, pays for those contracts, which Branch Rickey never did. Never. And, you know, in 1947, Jackie Robinson helps the Dodgers get within one game of winning the World Series. Right. They don't they don't win that pennant. We, we all know that in 47 without without Jackie Robinson. Um, and, and he makes them puts them into content, you know, that the run the Dodgers had at that period. But the Cleveland wins the World Series. The only one they've won since 1920 <laughs> in 1948. And Larry Doby's the star center fielder. And Page is not, you know, it's not 1965 when he still manages to hold the Red Sox scoreless for three innings. He's, although he's 42 years old in 1948, he's playing a, in, oh, however old he was, when, you know, he's he's playing a, a major role. He's the best reliever out of the bullpen. He's shutting the Braves down the World Series. So he went six and one, you know, right, he went, yeah, right. he was spot started, key yeah. spot starter. And, yeah. and, and so Vec is, is, if you were a hundred, the most, a hundred most more non-players in the baseball history, Bill Vec would be in there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That's my bias. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Dennis. 
uh, uh, some of the things that I just enjoyed about the book is your writing style and things that you injected into it. Um, the first thing that jumped out at me was in the chapter on, um, um, yeah, Jim Bowden. Yes. And you finish it by saying, before you finish reading this page, uh, before you before yeah, uh, read the uh, uh, wall four before you read chapter 14 okay. that's right. the bottom of chapter 13 that's right. the end of chapter 13 it just it's I, I enjoyed that um tommy john you talked about you know yes tommy john's in there i mean if your name's on the major surgery that every picture out there is, seems to be getting is great but when you talked about connections you put the connection i didn't realize he pitched the 46 i probably knew that at one time but completely forgot but you put the connection he started pitching when Kennedy was president and retired when Bush was president. Bush won, I think. And yeah. I, just little things like that, just it, it made it made the right the reading that much more enjoyable. It was a lot of baseball with really good stuff. I, I liked how you 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 use certain stats only you didn't go crazy on stats, but they're very good stats to use. But th that was the type of connections that just really made the book jump out of me that i just enjoyed re really reading it well thank you because that's you know those are the that's kind of what interests me right i mean the, you know i like the, the nice turn of phrase but also I, those connections are because it, you know there's i've been a baseball fan like you have for a long time and i'm fascinated by i sometimes ask myself why is this so important to me why do i lie in bed at night i was in, i was teaching today and we were talking about, you know, declining American hegemony and serious international relations stuff this class I teach. And, and I said, and I said, and someone was asking me something. He said, so, so, you know, what's the question that, that keeps you up in bed at night? Student says, and I say, remember, trying to remember obscure baseball statistics from the 1940s is what keeps me up at night. And, and so I'm always wondering why, but part of it is those connections. You know, part of it is that, you know, if you were, I mean, and, and one of the things I try to do in this book is I try to, my, I had a bunch of copies of the book shipped out to San Francisco because I, I need to, you know, give it away and sell some books out there. And I had them shipped to my mother's house. So my mother, who's in her 80s, but grew up here in New York, starts reading the book. And I said, you know, which I didn't ask her to do, she started reading it. And I said, what did you think? She said, well, I only read about the players I knew, which were the people who were playing in the 50s in New York. So that's Willie Mays, Mickey Mano, Yogi Berra. Uh, Joe DiMaggio a little bit, although she was, she was, no, no, she remember Joe DiMaggio playing, um, and Monty Irvin, and and so you know that's a connection. She hasn't thought about these people in such a long time, and I think in the I don't know if it was there was another thing I wrote where I was having dinner with a guy, probably in around a, a historian who was an older, and he's passed away since probably around 2017, and I've never talked. I've known this man since I was a very young child, and, he, and I've never talked baseball with him, really. And he looks at me over midway through dinner and says, so when Willie McCovey, this was in San Francisco, when Willie McCovey hit that line drive, was Richardson shifting or not? And I said, this is well over 50 years after that happened. And I said, well, he wasn't. And if he had been, the line drive would have gone by, but he wasn't. And he says, you know, I was at that game. And and just the way that this, these things stick in our memory, that that's what fascinates me about baseball. And and I can't explain why. Um, I think it's I think you speak for all of us. Yeah. And Gary, you and, have this and, question. And, yeah. I'm sorry. No, I should go, go on. I would just look at the next question. Yeah, I was just saying, um, like you use uh, statistics excellently. I mean, they're, they're just they just support the meat of what you put out there, which is the stories, the connections, and. Yeah, and all these little things are important to us. So, so yeah, you can go to the next question. The qu next question was, this is a very good question because it's on my mind a lot. Um, essentially, what do you think of the evolving uh, business alliance between MLB and gambling interests? You know, as a fan, I'm, I'm just outraged. I, I think this is this has the potential to really destroy the game. And and one thing to think about is, well, well first, Joe Jackson, Pete Rose, Hal Chase, they're all in this book. And maybe, and, and, and the, the hypocrisy, and I, I don't love Pete Rose. You know, I was never a Reds fan. I thought I never liked him all that much as a player. But to keep Pete Rose out and embrace gambling like this is oh, absurd. I agree. And, and I remember a few years ago watching the postseason. This is probably 2021. Pedro Martinez, who's on a lot of these shows, was, was either the person on the pregame show. And, you know, Pedro Martinez knows a few things about pitching. I mean, maybe hard to believe, obviously, right? He was a great pitcher. And so, so, 
And he was, and Max Scherzer was going that night for the Dodgers. And he's, and, and the announcer says the over on how many strikeouts Scherzer will get is going to be eight. What do you think of that? And he turns to Pedro Martinez and Pedro Martinez, who has this crazy idea that he's on television to talk about pitching, you know, given that he's one of the best living pitchers starts talking about, well, Scherzer needs to spot his fastball. And if you saw last time out, he was really like, if you're interested in baseball and kind of technical stuff about baseball and want to hear a real smart guy talk about pitching were very interesting to me as a fan. The guy cuts him off and starts explaining what the over is on uh-huh. betting, how many strikeouts. And Martinez is like, what are you like? So, so one, it's just like, it's, it's a way to bring in a cheap buck at the expense of just making the game a more enjoyable experience. But there's something else here. There's a line that, you know, well, nobody's going to bet on baseball because they make so much money. And it is true that Aaron Judge is not going to take a dive for any amount of money because he's just making so much. You know, when Shohei Otani signs this contract uh, for whatever it is, you know, he's not doing that, right? What about the guy who is 27 years old and let's say either was drafted out of high school in the U.S. or came to to, the, to play baseball in the minors, was, was signed by a team, an international you know, signing of some kind, and he's bounced around the minor leagues and never made more than $30,000 a year. And now he's in the big leagues, and it's July, August, whatever, and he's making the big league minimum for that third of the season that he's up there, and he knows he has a twinge in his arm. But he knows if he goes to the trainer, he's never seen the big leagues again. If you now that scenario on any given day during the baseball season, there are 50 pitchers to whom that applies. Now someone says that person is susceptible. So it does begin to undermine the ethics and the integrity of the game. So I'm I, I think it's and also it's just kind of unseemly and strange. And and gambling is an addiction. And, you know, running one ad gambling problem call, you know, which you're going to call that number after you've lost your house <laughs> because of a gambling debt. So so I, I'm I'm very concerned about it. I'm very concerned and I don't like it. I, I agree um, for many of the same reasons. I've got a cousin who's got a daughter and husband who make more money than God and watching the World Series. All they were doing was making bets while watching the ball game. They could care less about the game, but they were betting on everything out there. And it drove him crazy. So, yeah. yeah. And to Lincoln's point, something is bound to happen. You get a clubhouse guy who does something or umpires, like you said, a young player. You just never know. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it doesn't, the questions are always there. Yeah. Yeah. The concerns are always there. And that's bad enough. Before Lincoln, when you mentioned, why do you worry about these th- th- stats in the 40s? Why do we do that? That's what we're, type of people we are. Uh, John Thorne would give you a very perfectly good answer for that. He uh, was a key speaker at a Sabre convention a number of years ago. He looked at it and said, welcome baseball nerds. Just a, right. those two words kind of settled it off for all of us. Yeah, we're baseball nerds. That's what we do. But right. but I also, I, I remember once um, I wrote something and I said, it was some, I think, I forget where it was, but it was maybe been, I don't remember. And I was talking about why is it that, you know, that the details of Giants games in the 1970s are more important that something happened than something that happened in my professional life to me. Ten, or I remember that better than something that happened in my professional life 10 years ago. And the answer is because it's more important, right? I mean, this is one of the things that, you know, it's it it gets inside your head and it takes over. Yeah. Good one. I, I think echoing uh, what Dennis had said earlier about the uh, book uh, itself, I think the fact that you are, as you said, a someone with a different background, i.e. not a baseball slash sports writer, is a strength, I, I think. I, I think it, 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 your reading, or your writing is obviously very strong, uh, very enjoyable. Uh, and to me, like the baseball, oh, I, I speak for probably the whole group seeing the backgrounds on people's screens. Uh, we all have probably more baseball books than we should have. Uh, but the baseball book, best baseball books at the end of the day are those that are most readable. And I think yours is extremely readable. And also another thing with us baseball nerds, uh, it's hard to impress me in many ways. I always measure a baseball book by did I learn something new? And with your book, I learned something new. I learned a lot about female baseball players, which I knew nothing whatsoever about. And now I'm interested. Okay. And 
I, I think I probably speak for the group in saying that that's, that's a very strong aspect of your book. Well, thank you. And, and that was something I really wanted to do. And because I'm, I am, it, it, I am fascinated by this. And, and the one, the story that kind of got me the most uh, was Jackie Mitchell. Because if you read about what happened then, you know, she's so, so for those of you who haven't read the book yet, Jackie Mitchell in a barnstorming event in 1931 strikes out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig consecutively. And so this kind of gets shrouded in myth and legend as the decades go by. And this consensus emerges that it must have been a hoax. They must have been in on it. But if you read the accounts, it's not obvious at all that that was the case. And then you, and you say, well, why is it unimaginable that a good 17-year-old female pitcher could do this? Because it's not, it shouldn't be unimaginable. And to answer that question, what I tried to do was to explain what baseball was like in the 1930s. First of all, Ruth and Garrick did strike out a lot, you know, for players that are, and they were, and they, and they were more likely to strike out against left-handed pitchers. Obviously, they're both left-handed hitters. But many of the people, so we think today, you know, could a seventeen-year-old young woman in 1931 throw as hard as you know Garrett Cole? Well, of course not. But no one in 1931 could throw as hard as Garrett Cole, so it's an irrelevant question. Could Jackie Mitchell throw as hard as the number three starter on the St. Louis Browns in a league that excluded people uh, who, who weren't white for a team that didn't have the resources to really do any real scouting in a, in, in a league where the best players on the West Coast very rarely came East, right? In any given year, the San Francisco Seals usually could beat the bottom three or four teams in the major leagues, just flat out. Right. And that's probably true for two other teams in the PCL. The San Francisco Seals, which is the hat I'm wearing now, were in terms of their dominance, the Yankees of the PCL. They were pretty much the, the best team. Um, so so now, you know, and and if those those back of the rotation hacks could occasionally strike out Ruth or Gehrig, why couldn't Jackie Mitchell, a 17 year old, 17 year old young woman, probably in better physical shape than some of the 35 year old old dudes pitching in, in the major leagues? Her had befriended Dazzy Vance, who's a Hall of Fame pitcher, to help her, to coach her, to train her. So it's entirely plausible. And if it's entirely plausible that she can do that, then it's entirely plausible that she was good enough to play in the major leagues in the 1930s. But uh, Judge Kinosaw Mountain Landis, in his with his um, unbounded appetite for exclusion, just bans her. Ter- you know, and before she and and that's a big part of baseball story, and we have to we have to reckon with that. And she was left-handed, you know, which yeah. which yeah. helps against Gehrig and, and Ruth, right. especially. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a small sense of size. I mean, one game, of course, you can strike him out. They've never seen her before, for starters. Yeah. Right. But the next game, they might have each home runs off of her, right? But that's baseball. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah and one point. thing I like about your book is, yeah, you, you go on little tangents, um, but they really support um, mm-hmm. what you're trying to, and, and, you know, the reason you put them in the book. Yeah. Well, the thing about writing baseball books, which I learned early on, is that you have to tell baseball stories. Because baseball fans, like readers, like you, um, you like the baseball stories, right? So, so if you want people to buy the book, I'll tell the stories. And, and that's also the fun part. But the challenge is to tell the stories that people haven't heard before, right? What can I say new about Babe Ruth? What can I say new about Willie Mays, about Jackie Robinson? And those are those are the challenges. Um Manley, you had a question? Uh, yeah, you were talking about Jackie Mitchell. Is Tony Stone in your book? No. But again, you know, there's what well, could have been, you know, just a. Ela Bordas is, who, of course, played in Madison. Mm-hmm. And Alyssa Nacken is. Um, a couple of women. Uh, Connie Wisniewski is from the AAGPPL. There's a few others. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you have um, Dottie Kamenchak. So- right. So just real briefly, Cammy, that was her nickname. She's probably the best player right. all around. Uh, maybe Jean Fault was another one, um, mostly as a pitcher, but she could hit. Um, Wisniewski, I, I was really fascinated on your perspective of it because she was, I mean, she was a great player. Um, she was a tremendous underhand pitcher. So the league was underhand from 43 to about 48. You know, they went to sidearm and then overhand and um, she didn't handle overhand pitching, but she was tremendous as an underhand oh. pitcher. So, so we have the, we had the Milwaukee chicks. So she absolutely right. 
carried that team to a championship their one year here in Milwaukee. Um, but then she uh, remade herself to be an outfielder, an all-star outfielder. So what, yeah, just what you'd like to say on that. Cause um, yeah, she wasn't, I don't know if I'd consider her the best person in the league, but she certainly well, was one of them. And, and maybe she, um, she really kind of made the league viable to continue until 54. Cause a lot of people didn't expect them to last that long. One of the things that, that I wanted to talk about some, somewhere in the book is, and, and the AAGPBL allowed me to do this, and she became a good way to do that because for these reasons, right, because she does these different things, is how does what, be, what we know as MLB, but what we used to know as the AL and the NL, consolidate its hegemony? In 1935, the best team in Pittsburgh was the Pittsburgh Crawfords, not the Pittsburgh Pirates, right? In 1935, the if you were to the 30 best teams in America, in the United States, 10 of this, you know, 10 might have been major league teams, maybe fewer, because you throw in Negro, but let's make it 20, 20, the 20 best teams. It's it's not obvious in 1935 that the Crawfords and Seals are going to fade away and the Pirates are going to be the team that survives. And And when you had, so you had different streams of baseball. And to some extent, the AAGP PBL is the last one in the United States. And when you lose that, you lose the innovation. Because think of what happened when players from Negro Leagues came into the American International League. They changed the way they, and also from, from um, the Caribbean, the rest of Minoso people like that, Louis Aparicio, they changed how the game was played. And we lose something with the innovation when we, when we lose that. Um, Gary, you had a question about personal exchanges i have to think um i've had so so naturally the personal exchanges in the book tend to skew towards uh giants so the players with whom i had personal exchanges were willie mays who that didn't sway me particularly um because it was a brief you know he was not he was quite old and willie mays is good days and bad days um you know willie mccovey who i over the years in various kind of fan capacities i bumped into once in an airport you know that kind of thing um I was sitting, I, I, my, my stepfather went to medical school with a guy who for years was one of the doctors with the Giants. And we used to get uh, really nice tickets uh, for, from him. So I'm sitting with my sons uh, and my wife at a game by, where, the, where the players' wives are sitting. It was before the game and Buster Posey's wife is there. And it was the day after he signed the $168 million contract. And hearing her discuss it, it was really fascinating. Just like this, this $168 million, right? This kind of life-changing, unimaginable money. And hearing her uh, discuss it, that was fascinating. The one player who I had a rather lengthy exchange with was uh, Vita Blue. And if and and I interviewed him for, I interviewed him, I can't reach it, but for my book, The Giants and Their City. And he's recently passed away, unfortunately. And it was just a great interview. And, and, and Vita Blue can be great in interviews and sometimes not. People will tell you that. And um, well, actually, uh, while I'm on that thought, and at the end of the interview, he reached into his bag. He asked, do you have a pen? I said, I'm a professor. Of course, I have a pen. And he, just without asking, signed a baseball. I would never, you know, sign a baseball for me. Um, and that was very sweet of him. But I, I the chapter in Vita Blue is one of my favorite chapters because it's really, because I write a lot about San Francisco history. And I think Vita Blue is is in an odd way, which you can read about in the book, instrumental in, in, in saving the city of San Francisco. And uh, that that's in this book. I write a lot about that in San Francisco Year Zero, which is a kind of a book about, uh, it's called Subtitle is Political Upheaval, Punk Rock, and a Third Place Baseball Team. And it's about the one year of 1978. And then the other player with whom I had an interaction was Dusty Baker, who I interviewed for uh, the Giants and their city. And it was a phone interview, but Dusty Baker was just like so funny and charming. And, 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 you know, he, he remembered in the 1989 earthquake, not only did he remember where he was at that exact moment, but he remembered that he was eating the specific snack he was eating, <laughs> <laughs> you know, banana nut bread. He said it like three times, I'm eating banana nut bread in the clubhouse getting ready to go out. And this happens. So, so that was just, I mean, and, and that's, that purports with Dusty Baker's reputation, you know, everyone will tell you that he's such a great guy and he just is. So that was, those were the ones that I've had personal interactions with. Was, is there anyone that you're like, 
wow, I, I should have put them in. Like, I really missed. You know, I mean, there's a few. I think that I think that either Bill White or, or Albert Pujols. But I just couldn't. Pujols is such a great player. He's such a great player. There's not. This is not the hundred greatest players. There's a lot of great players who are left out of this book. You know, Tris Speaker, Mike Schmidt. There's, but, um, I, I didn't. I don't know what what you know. He's the greatest Dominican player, ever probably. But there's. I don't know. The stories of Dominicans in baseball are so important. And I wanted to tell that story. And I tell that through three players, largely. Uh, Felipe Alou, Juan Marichal, and even somebody who wasn't a giant, Pedro Martinez. And and I felt like they were... Martinez is a more important player than Pujols. And Martinez, Martinez, it's hard to compare them. Martinez was a pitcher, obviously. Pujols was a hitter. But I think Martinez is a more important, more interesting player. So, so I just... But something didn't feel right about leaving him out. Bill White... You know, Joe Cronin is in there. Bill White is, and I kind of I wrestled with that one a little bit. Did Carlton Fisk make it into the book? Uh, no, I, I, you know, a, a great player. That the, the 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 home run is what would have got him in, but I had to kind of choose between Gibson, Fisk, uh, Thompson, and I guess Mazeroski for like that, and I think Thompson wins that one. Yeah, I especially liked Fisk from the standpoint of, uh, you know, sure, the 75 World Series Game 6 uh, is iconic, but I especially liked his uh, attitude about protecting the integrity of the game and his exchange with Deion Sanders. Yeah, he's a great player, you know, and, and but I I feel like that doesn't, like five years from now, no one's going to remember that. You know what I mean? Like that's, I mean, it's, it felt a little too, like, like there's a lot of players who I could, like if I, I felt like that was lowering the bar, frankly, too much. Um, but you know, but the, the, you know, I mean, I, because I would have put Thurman Munson in before, before Carl hmm. Right. So, you know, and I didn't put Johnny Bench in who was probably a better player than either of them. I just didn't put him in. Um, cause I don't think Bench was. Any thought to, uh, uh, to putting, cause I, I always, we Puerto Ricans have 21, the Dominicans have 27 and the Venezuelans have 13. Any thought of putting Dave Concepcion in the, on the, in the book? No. Okay, because to Venezuelans, he's the icon. I mean, basically. I know, I know, but I mean, you know, uh, I, I guess so. But I think, I mean, first of all, I'm I'm fascinated by the Concepcion for the Hall of Fame uh, debate because it all rests on him winning two consecutive World Series, which, as my friend who's a diehard Ace fan says, yeah, Campanero's only won three in a row. And yeah, I'm not, sure. Like, yeah. I'm not sure he's like. I I'm not sure he's a Hall of Famer. He's just no, an icon know. to Venezuela. No, but I, I guess so. Yeah, but and and um, but you know, I put Miguel Cabrera in the book, uh, yeah. as you know, in that way, and and then and, and the same way that I left Pujols out, I put Cabrera in on those terms. But I I would think Louis Aparicio would be it would be a similar icon. I don't know. Um, and I don't think... too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of players who are. I mean, you know, there's kind of Greenberg, DiMaggio, Musial, who are kind of you know. Uh, and of course, Jackie Robinson, who for specific groups of Americans have great importance, right? Yeah. Not, not the global front, but the kind of ethnic American. So I tried to cover that that base as well. Right. It's a wonderful list. I'm not, I'm not nitpicky. Oh, no, but I, I mean, it's it's my list. It's, it's I, I, any good book should start more, should raise more questions and answer them, right? I mean, right, right. Yeah. And any good reader should leave with more questions and answers. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. You um, used very few statistics, but for it, it shied away from traditional, but had some real basic, uh, more advanced statistics that you use regularly. Why did you choose those? I happen to really like the ones that you choose. So well, chose. I wanted, you know, I did use things like I would, I would throw in a conventional statistics, went the home runs and things like that when necessary. I wanted to choose uh, to winnow down the advanced metrics to things I could explain in a sentence or two and that I felt actually had real meaning. And I basically, ERA plus uh, for pitchers really was the only one I think I used, war for all players, and then OPS plus and slash lines. And slash lines aren't really a, an, an advanced metric. They're, they're a new way to represent, you know, instead of going batting average home runs RBI, it's batting OBP slugging. Um, and I felt that those are, you know, the, the the war and the OPS ERA plus allow us to compare across eras, which you always have to do. 
Um, and I explained that, that there's an introduction where I talk about the statistics right. and what which ones I used and which ones I didn't. You always have to do that. But at the same time, you know, if someone hit 700 home runs, that, that number is important, right? Or if someone hit, you know, had a 340 batting average or something, you know, lefty O'Doul, who's in the book for a lot of reasons. But, you know, I cite his batting average at the end, 349 batting average. That's very impressive. Any other questions or comments or? Yeah, I've got a comment uh, regarding something not in the book, but uh, right in the very beginning, you used Casey Stingle to link Honest Wagner with um, Dick Allen. And I just want to uh, tell you a little story about, um, I was at the Minnesota, at the Minneapolis Saber Convention uh, back in the 80s. And I was talking with Joe Hauser from Sheboygan who played who was managed by Connie Mack. So here he and I were talking about Connie Mack who was born during the Civil War. That just shows what a delightful, you know, long history baseball has. That's, that that's fantastic, yeah. And that someone like you talk to someone, that that's exactly the, the point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really cool. Speaking of Joe Hauser, any thought to putting any minor league legends on the book? No. Okay. Um, you know, and 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 also, I didn't put, for example, now where I come from, PCL is not viewed as the pre nineteen fifty fifty eight PCL is not viewed as a minor league. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, there are a lot of people on the West Coast who would not be comfortable with that. But I did not put PCL players in unless they also played in the big leagues. Okay. And then I tell, and then really, Lefty O'Doul, who's extremely fascinating, and there's a documentary. I don't know if it's out yet about him. Um, that John Lee Nadakis, who you may know, uh, is making or has made. But uh, O'Doul is how I talk about the PCL. That's the player. I mean, DiMaggio and Williams are in the book uh, for a whole lot of reasons. Some obvious, some less obvious. But uh, And they play in the PCL as well, of course. Williams like to talk hitting with Lefty O'Doul. Well, yeah, I can imagine, right? They they both knew a lot about it. Right? Mm -hmm. Williams is a fascinating, fascinating figure. And... Uh, I have a question. Oh, sorry, go on. A, a question. Um, you know, you you've got some examples of. I haven't read the book, but uh, it sounds like you have some examples of, you know, people who did something, uh, idiosyncratic kinds of things as opposed to long range things. Uh, is Gibson in the book for his home run against the A's? Uh, no. And, and again, I, you know, I, you know, you could write a book, I'm sure it's been written about, you know, the 10 or 15 most important famous home runs in baseball history. Gibson is obviously on that list. Hmm. I went with Bobby Thompson to kind of, you know, uh, to kind of um, represent that. And, you know, people could debate that. But I, I think that Thompson's coming at such an interesting time in the history where it becomes known as the shot heard around the world because uh, we have troops. It's the first time the United States has, has radio and then troops all over the world after, after you know, the beginning of the Korean War, the beginning of the Cold War. So that's why I, I went with Bobby Thompson over Kirk Gibson. But, but you know, I mean, for example, um, I have a handful of players, just to give another sideways example, um, lateral example, players who are, for, you know, one team, right? And, and, you know, so for the Orioles, I put Cal Ripken, rather than Brooks Robinson, because I think Ripken, you know, you could argue which is a better, Ripken was a better player, but um, because I, you know, and they both were deep ties to Baltimore and the Orioles and all that, but you can't include everybody, you know, so you have to sometimes make decisions. Um, you know, Brett, George Brett and Mike Schmidt um, are, well, that's great about John. Um, George Brett and Mike Schmidt, are kind of have these parallel careers. From my view, Schmidt's the better player. They both spend their entire career with one city and one team in one city. But it tips over to me to put Brett in because of that pine tar incident. <laughs> and and what strikes me about the pine tar incident, two things. One is it it, it gets at how baseball is both a real and imaginary space. Because can you imagine going to your workplace tomorrow and behaving like George Brett did? ever right i mean the, watching that video because i was you know it's like high school when it happened but watching that video like he, he, to see an adult behave that way without like 
like someone else grabbed me. Like it was just, it's really striking. And then the second thing is, which I always remember at the time, but it's really was like kind of gets forgotten. Billy Martin was absolutely right. There's no interpretation of the rules on Brett's side, but everyone hated Billy Martin and the Yankees and George Steinbrenner. And I thought that was just so interesting. So, so that's an example. I, I chose Brett over Schmidt, who otherwise have very similar credentials because it told, and I, and I like Schmidt more as a player um, because it told such, such an additional interesting story. You, you talked about Thompson being your choice for the, the, uh, his home run. It's important to me because I was uh, our high a high school teacher let us uh, listen to the radio uh, for it, and I found out that there were some adults who were interested in baseball, not just kids. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah, yeah. Where and were it, you at the time? In a small like, high city? school in Wisconsin. Okay, pretty cool. It was a cool story, and that's yeah. Everybody was story. listening. Because it shows how important baseball was back then. You know, you're in Wisconsin. You don't have a root. You know, you might have a rooting interest, but you're not. You know, it's not. You're not not New York. In New York, the world stopped on that day, right? Um, but it's important enough that in a small high school, the teacher thinks it's important, knows the kids are interested, and in, and that's that's the role baseball used to play in our culture. And that's one of the things I try to track in this story by talking about players like Mike Trout, more more contemporary players. Mike Trout uh, is an example of that. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Let me just take a minute here. Um, yeah, I think that Gary, your, this assessment is, 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 is right. Um, and, and, and Williams, you know, um, and let me say the last one. Yeah. And Ryan, you're probably right too, but George was right. Star Bennett was right. Um, but, but what strikes me about Williams is the, I'm, you know, Adrian Burgos Jr. I'm sure you, some of you know his work and yeah. we used to do a podcast together and all this. Um, but, you know, Adrian's playing America's Game Book. He talks about the complexity of the exclusion of Latino ballplayers, right? And the two players in this book, well, the three players, really, but Torriente we talked about, one is Dolph Luque, who is Cuban and pitches in the major leagues quite well, but is always known as Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. He's light-skinned. Um, gosh, I forgot. the, the Oh, the, and the other is Ted Williams. Mexican. Mexican. Yeah. Yeah. And and Ted Williams is kind of keeping the secret while he's playing. And he gets this rap as being angry and all this stuff, which if you filter through an understanding of race today, it's it's absolutely fascinating. And then in 1966, he gets, you know, just obviously deservedly inducted into the Hall of Fame after this career as this, you know, tough guy, you know, fought in two wars, you know, never a nice guy. But but and then he gives a speech and he basically looks around and says, why is Satchel Page not here? This is fantastic. Or, well, where's Josh Gibson? Right? I mean, this is, and, and everyone has to rethink who this guy is. The other Dom DiMaggio in one of these oral histories tells a story about Williams where they're playing the in Cleveland in, you know, 48, one of those years where there's a really close race. Al Rosen, you know, so it was later than 48 because uh, Ken Keltner was still the third baseman in 48. But Al yeah. Rosen uh, hits, gets the game-winning hit against the Red Sox. So he and Dom DiMaggio go into a bar after the game. Williams was not, it was a big guy, right? He's not a small man. And someone approaches Ted Williams and says, what's it like to get beaten by a Jew? And Williams decks him, just punches him out, knocks him out, of course. And, and, and so, so he had, like, he was more thoughtful. I suppose that might be my subjective view that punching someone out for saying that is thoughtful but I will still defend that view, right? He was more thoughtful about a lot of these issues than a lot of people, which gets to, to go full circle, the discussion we had about Jackie Robinson. Because first of all, how many runs would he have driven in, Ted Williams, with Robinson and Dom DiMaggio on the bases, right? I forget that, right? I mean, that's extraordinary. But what would that relationship have been like as teammates? We'll never know, obviously. But but to me, that's... that's uh, Williams is a fascinating player. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, so like, you know, um, I would say to Ryan, to your question about Bill White, if, you know, I don't vote on these things, but yes, I think that there's a category of people who get like 75% there in more. So, so 75% there as a player, because he wasn't really a Hall of Fame player. 75% there as an executive, put the guy in. Felipe Alou, 75% there as a player, 75% there as a manager. 
Dusty Baker, I think, has crept over 75% as a manager. You know, Joe Torre did too. But I think I think guys like that who contribute a lot in a few different areas, but not superlatively. As, 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 a, as a particularly outspoken pioneer of the times, just like Hank Aaron was, I think he did, I think that's another point in his favor. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And also one of the greatest defensive first basemen ever, along with Hell Chase, Keith Hernandez. Right, Peter right. Pedro. Isn't that right? And, 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 you know, he played on a team where, where they were producing first basemen like it was, you know, yeah. you know right? I think he was the third best first baseman of that era for that team. That's pretty amazing, right? And none of them could play any other positions. He could play a little bit in the outfield, but the rest couldn't. The others couldn't. Any other questions or comments? I love this, the discussion. Yes, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. It, thank you. Again, thank it's you. It's been Look, fascinating. All days are coming so, up. Yeah, we're going to, um, we give away, our, our the way we do our book club is we give away a copy of the book. So um, um, I'll put my email in the chat. And Dennis, do you, are you running the lottery? I can do that. I got. Uh... Or I can do it. No, I got a very good setting here. Uh, Don't put me in. Uh, no, obviously. I didn't. Or me. Um, well, I do have you in there, but if you get the number, you just say no. Okay. Uh, Lincoln, if you could select a number between one and nine. Did I say it out loud? Should I just select yeah. it? Eight. And then your work is done. Please. Number eight. Uh, Francis. Oh, Dan. Oh, Francis wins everything. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I didn't even you know all I've been doing the listening. I haven't stuff. even <laughs> thrown out any questions, but it was well you can you can bring it to the can you can bring your free book to the convention with your free you know so to be uh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I I uh, I look forward to reading it. I really Thank do. You. Ask you for your for a loto number for the Powerball number. Jeez. Yeah, well, I know, really, right? Yeah. It it is, maybe, I, maybe I should just eight. Bet on eight, everybody. <laughs> Francis, I, I think you have my email anyway, but I put yeah. it in the chat. Yeah, so I'm sure it's can, the one on I the think way. I have your address anyway, I, or I can get yeah. it. Hey, Mary, yeah. I'll send the book out. Yeah, we, it's okay. my. Would you like me to give me, you my address, or it's in the chat uh, on the directory? Yeah, I'll, I'll just get your. Uh, address from the directory if it's in there. It's if it's in Saber. Yes, it's Rugosa okay. Drive in Greensboro. Yes. Uh -huh. Sounds great. Enjoy the book. Yeah, thank you. A, thank you. It's a very enjoyable read. You'll very enjoy. Good it. Book. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was. I think it was great that eight, uh, which will always mean uh, Carl Yastrzemski to me, was selected. <laughs> yeah. I know you put you put a number and it it means yeah. a lot more to people like us than. Other well, I was thinking Yogi Berra for some reason, but I didn't particularly. Hey, that's that's yeah. great too. Yogi Berra is a yeah, mm -hmm. great. Yeah, well, Martin, for me, I will say for me, my favorite player growing up as a Detroit Tigers fan was Ray Boone, and he wore number eight. Oh wow! So, <laughs> Good shot. Yeah, that works out. Yeah. But I, I appreciate that very much, and I do look forward to reading the book. It's been a, I didn't ask questions, but it was a fascinating discussion. Yeah. And you. a lot of names. I'd like to know how many names were thrown out in this this, this conversation. It was a lot of people. Yeah. I think I told yeah. Mary when I saw those Luca in the book. I was like, okay, I'm buying this book because yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the woman for me, you know, it it, it really. Um, had importance for a lot of different people. So great job on the book, Thank Lincoln, you. and the discussion. Just fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's always, I love doing these things and, you know, happy to come back anytime. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you much. Great time. Thank you so much for your time. And Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care.